Uh, so my name is Greg Reeker. I'm one of the co-founders for Long Path, also an associate professor at University of Colorado. Um, Carolyn is the uh, VP of uh, Products and Markets at, at Long Path, but also one of the co-founders, and we've been working together on this uh, for seven years or more. So, um, so it's it's fantastic, and I think both of us are very excited to be back on the farm, albeit virtually. I did my PhD work in mechanical engineering with Ron Hansen at Stanford, and uh, Carolyn did her postdoctoral work with Noah Diffenbaugh, and so uh, we both have. I've got my Stanford mug over here, and you know we're close to the wear farm. my Stanford T-shirt today. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we're really, really happy for the opportunity, Evan. It's a great forum that you've been putting together. I, the timing hasn't worked traditionally for me, so I, but I've been keeping up with the YouTube videos, and uh, it's just a tremendous forum that you got here. And and so Carolyn and I were going to present gas, garbage, and grazers: um, the history and future of long path monitoring with frequency comms. And so we're going to talk about this sort of large area trace gas monitoring that we do with the frequency combs. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about methane. It's definitely a methane technology. Um, but fundamentally, as I'll talk about the laser, it's a trace gas monitoring technology. It's a carbon monitoring system. So we can do CO2 and CO and other molecules. So kind of keep that in mind as you go. And the footprint of the system, this large area monitoring capability, um, is really interesting for other, uh, you know, opportunities in monitoring in the long run. So we really, you know, feel there's a bright future for this technology, and we're always happy to collaborate, so we hope that folks will reach out. Carolyn, if you want to go to the next slide, this is sort of long path in a, in a, from a high level. And so what's really unique about long path, and we've started to get this moniker, the 5G of methane, is that we've got a continuous monitoring system that a single tower sort of covers a 20 square mile or about 13,000 acre region around it um, to measure you know, the methane emissions and quantify them. And what's interesting about this is we also operate it a little bit like a, almost like a cellular network in the sense that we install the systems, we maintain them, we maintain the communications, we do the upgrades. So it's a little bit like your cell phone in the sense that you sort of pay for your data, but you don't worry about the towers and the, the support equipment. That's how Long Path operates as well. We worry about the lasers and all that. It's just the data that comes into the customer. What's, this has all been enabled by this unique Nobel Prize winning frequency comb laser. Um, it's a Nobel Prize from right here at Colorado. And this is one of the, the early commercial applications of it. And we'll talk a bit about that. It's been Department of Energy backed and our team has been backed by the Department of Energy for many years to develop and test this. Um, we're on a rapid growth cycle, so we'll show at the, at the end that while Long Path has been around for a while, the, the, the reach of Long Path has been growing very, very rapidly due to this high scalabil scalability of this sort of distributed approach or networked approach. So we've got 280 square miles of coverage with 14 operators that's really cropped up since July of 2021, and we're on track to add 1,000 square miles in 2022, um, probably double that number of operators. What else is interesting is because of our academic backgrounds, I mean, both Carolyn and I are from University of Colorado, you know, and Stanford, as we talked about, we've done a lot of third-party blind testing that we've published in the peer-reviewed literature. So we'll sprinkle that throughout and you can dig more into the system there. So if you go to the next slide, you know, this is, um, as I kind of alluded to, long path is these long beams, but it's also this very long path of development that we've followed, um, which is, we think at the end of the day, produced a very unique technology. So. I started on the project in 2012 at NIST um, as a scientist there, and this is what a dual frequency comb laser spectrometer, which is what we use and we'll talk about in a moment, looked like in 2012. There's about five of them in the world, um, and it was very expensive and very environmentally sensitive. Nevertheless, we showed um, in those early years that this was a really unique way to do long distance trace gas sensing. Um, so there's a bit of a myth that's going around, you know, that long path systems are $300,000 and all this. That system right there is $300,000. If you click again, Carolyn, this system is not. So we're much, much lower cost than that. <laughs> that's, the, that's just something that has gone around. We don't know why. Um, and uh, and ARPA-E had the monitor program that started up in about 2015, and we were part of that. And so we took this really bulky unit from the laboratory and we um, uh, engineered it down into what's just a little 19 inch rack mount system. There's a, a laptop computer for scale on top of that. So we made it low cost, we made it road, portable and robust. And then we did the first measurements to show that we could measure small amounts of methane from long distances. If you click again, 
in 2017, RPE said, hey, this is great. You've hit a lot of milestones. If you can find a commercial path for this, we'll continue to help. And so um, in 2017, we founded Long Path Technologies and we started doing the MeTech blind testing. We'll show some of those results today. And the first industry pre-commercial deployments where we found out all the different ways this can break, found out how we should deliver, you know, actionable data to the customer and sort of these scaled down pilots. And if you click again, Carolyn, we're, we, in 2020, started our first commercial deployments. So you can see the cabinet and the laser over on the right there is much, much more refined. We're doing full scale pilot or pilots where we're covering, you know, between 15 and 25 facilities with a single laser system over this 13,000 acre region. And if you click again, that brings us to sort of 2021 20, and beyond where we've really started to expand quickly and are building sort of basin-wide networks, the early part portions of basin-wide networks with cross-operator coverage. So this is a picture of the Delaware over plant, you know, overlaid with our current sort of footprint. And it's about three, maybe 400 long path sensors to create a continuous monitoring network across the entire Delaware basin. So a very exciting prospect that we're working on every day. So if you click to the next slide, this is sort of the overview for the rest of the talk. and and. And we're, we're excited to kind of talk about, you know, think about this overview as your key takeaways as well. We hope to show you that this is a really unique way of monitoring with some interesting benefits. It's been proven in the peer-reviewed literature, as we'll show. And then Carolyn will take over and talk about field data that shows sort of these emissions and cost benefits of continuous. That's been one of the, the questions in our head, and I think one of the myths around continuous is, you know, just how good can it be in terms of reducing emissions and, and can it be cost beneficial? And we've shown now with our field data that it can. Then we'll talk about, you know, high sensitivity continuous quantification as a scalable means um, to do monitoring at a reasonable cost. And so um, we'll hopefully prove that as well today. And then finally, we'll talk about how long paths approach is applicable to monitoring in diverse applications. And we, we hope that we will make some new connections on this call today for those future directions. So here is kind of how the technology works in a nutshell. So the left is sort of this typical, you know, hub and spoke way that we deploy. There's a central node, that's where the laser is, that's in the upper right there. Um, that central node is the only place that needs communications and power, which is very, very beneficial for these kinds of difficult uh, environments. On top of that tower is the telescope that sends and receives this infrared iSafe laser beam. That laser beam can go up to three miles right now. We're working every day to kind of keep pushing that radius. And at the far end of the, the beams are the facilities that we look at. And on those facilities, we place passive reflectors that you can see in the bottom right photos. And then yeah, at the end of the beams as Carol was pointing out there. Those are little glass cubes. They're passive, there's no power. Um, and so they're very, very flexible in terms of where you put them. And so we often raise these or elevate these you know, between 15 and 30 feet off the ground in our areas where there are stick flares. And so again, one of the continuous monitoring uh, myths that's out there is that continuous monitors can't uh, find these long distance or these uh, high emissions like flares. You absolutely can, you just need that long true fence line beam that we have along with the high elevation of the far end of the beam. So if you click again, let me talk just a little bit about the sensor because it's, it's unique and it's, it's really neat in terms of its flexibility for future applications. So this is based on frequency comb lasers. These are lasers that emit hundreds of thousands of colors of light in the infrared. And we use about 50,000 of those wavelengths at, these, at, at this kind of wavelength range shown here in the upper left, about 1650 nanometers. And we're covering this whole spectrum, this whole region where there are absorption fingerprints of different gases. And so each of those, what you see there is the laser absorbance is a function of wavelength. And each of those little spikes is where there's a quantum energy level transition in these molecules that will absorb the laser light. So if you click again, Carolyn, we zoom in and you can see this, the, these different little uh, spikes correspond to different gases. And so you see methane in the middle there. You see CO2 in this regular pattern, and indeed there's CO2 under, you know, underlying that methane. One of the nice things about the broadband laser is we see the CO2 and we can measure it and quantify and eliminate its interference with the methane absorption. There's also water vapor, CO, H2S, all sorts of interesting molecules in this range that we can hit. 
So the last thing I'll say kind of about this frequency comb is it's based on the same frequency comb technology that's used in optical clocks at NIST to define our second. And so that's all to say this is an extremely stable, extremely well-controlled system. And so if you click again, um, the bottom line is for an instrument that's measuring methane or other gases, it's very, very low, low drift and never needs calibration. I know that's a bold statement. Uh, we've proven that in, in the scientific literature, that Waxman paper down there, when we took two systems and put them side by side with no calibration and showed that they track within a quarter of a percent. Um, no species interference because we see the forest and the trees in terms of these absorption fingerprints. No sensor aging, no water vapor degradation. And that's uh, really, really beneficial. The system works the same on day one as it does on day 1000, which is really interesting. And then it's built on telecommunications, optical fiber and components. So the very first portable system we built in 2015 is still working today. Um, so we say kind of seven plus year lifetime there. It really is infrastructure, telecom infrastructure. So if you go to the next slide, um, this kind of talks about how we do the quantification, which is covered in a couple of these publications here. So you've got this laser coming in. If you click again, Carolyn, the, the laser comes in from the distant tower up to three miles away. And then we've got these retroreflectors that form endpoints for our beams. And if you click again, we have an emission, if we have an emission, um, and the, the wind is kind of carrying within these wind angles that will cover that fence line, we can see an enhancement in the amount of methane on one of the beams versus the other. And that's very important because if you click again, there are a lot of sources of methane out there. And so you need to be able to differentiate what's happening on pad from what's happening on the neighboring pads and, and more kind of globally in terms of the, the boundary layer dynamics. And we do that with these kind of pairs of beams. So if you click to the next slide, what's, what's kind of unique and interesting about this is not just our ability to elevate the beam, but that this is a true fence line measurement. So when we're doing quantification, we quantify in 80 to 100% of the facility, you know, at a given time, or if we know the wind direction, we can kind of quantify how much of the facility we're covering. And that's unique because if you think about sort of the continuous monitoring point sensors, um, there's an interesting problem of sort of having, you know, gaps between sort of the fence posts, as we call it, um, uh, around those facilities. So that's a really unique aspect of this. And we've shown that this is very effective when, we're, when it comes to getting things off of tanks, off of flares, off of high infrastructure. So if we click to the next one, um, that's also a bit of an issue when it comes to dealing with some of the background emissions that are coming from elsewhere. So let's click again. We've proven this, this uh, technology out. And so this is, uh, uh, many of you will recognize this photo, a wonderful, wonderful facility for, for our community. The Methane Emissions Technology Evaluation Center, which we're fortunate to be about an hour and a half south of them. So it's easy for us to go up there and do testing on that uh, um, facility. We place our system up near the CSU Atmospheric Sciences Building up there about three quarters of a mile away and then rain the, the laser beams down onto the facility. And so the next slide starts to show some of those results. So we did two rounds of this testing. The first one was sort of the, what they call R1 in, and it's simple emissions profile, sim simple single steady emissions. And so from a detection perspective, we show that on the left there, it did extremely well. Um, you can see the detection rates uh, there as a function of leak size. And we did well all the way down to about a standard cubic foot per hour which is 0 0.02 MCF per day from this three quarters of a mile distance. So really unique in terms of its ability to detect sensitively from long distance. On the right there, we show the quantification. And so that's the estimated emission rate from our system on the vertical axis, the true emission rate on the horizontal axis, uncertainty bars for both, which is what forms that cross. And so the quantification here, standard deviation is about plus or minus 27% on this quantification round. That's published in a 2019 ESNT paper by Carolyn. Next, next um, uh, image, we also did localization, which is an interesting thing with these long beams. Um, and so we were fully uh, able to localize to each of the sort of sub pads of the METEC facility, if you know it. And then we we're 87% um, accurate in getting the right piece of equipment or its neighbor in terms of localizing down to the next level. And we can talk about that more in the discussion later. Next slide. 
is when we went for our second um, round of testing. So this was more complex emissions profiles, uh, 15 different leak scenarios that had intermittency, had multiple leak points. And so it makes it actually much, much harder to visualize the data. So I apologize that this left graph is really hard to take in all at once, but green is good. The size of the dot is, you know, coincide, coincides with the size of the leak. Um, pink and orange are not so good, but you can see that all of our pinks and oranges were small, less than uh, five standard cubic foot per hour in terms of the emission rate. And so then the quantification is on the right. We did well again for steady leaks. You can see the intermittency is the, the purple triangles that are the much harder ones to quantify. It's in some ways hard to even say, like, what is, how, how do you report an emissions rate from an intermittent emission? But nevertheless, you can see that we trend along that one-to-one -one line, which is, which is great. So this is up on archive um, and uh, will be under review here soon. So that's the round two. If we, I, I think at this point, then I wanted to kind of hand it over to Carolyn to talk about how we started to move this system into the field and some of the unique applications of it. Sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, with the system kind of having been blind tested, we went out and started to do some long term measurements. So this project was actually supported. This deployment was supported uh, by the Department of Energy, the Office of Fossil Energy, because this was still a pre-commercial system. So you can see the installation was about November 17, uh, 2017. And there also there's some, some gaps in the data because while we did operate the system remotely from six states away, which was impressive with a basically a, a pre-prototype, um, there it was still hard to hard to man wrangle at that point. But um, you can see here, um, it was a, a pretty large facility, and we're we're looking here at the dry air mole fraction of methane, so concentrations across the different beam paths that that cut through this this piece of the facility, and so um, at this underground storage facility. Uh, lo and behold, we found the same exact type of distribution that folks were finding from doing, um, uh, looking at a whole bunch of sites in the snapshot. So obviously, so many folks, including a lot of folks on this call, had did, done a lot of groundbreaking work in terms of going out and scanning an entire basin and trying to get a sense of what those emissions distributions were. They were log normal or, or something around that, you know, basically super fat tailed. And so what we went out, monitored a single facility for a year and found the same distribution. So that was really, really interesting moment. So here, uh, what was also really cool about this is we had extremely frequent aircraft surveys. So there was monthly aircraft surveys, which is more than, than most folks um, are doing anywhere. Um, and so we were able to, you know, compare that against true continuous data. And you can see it's these outlier events that really are not captured by the aircraft. So those are, you know, the top 10% of the largest emission events contributed to 40% of the total uh, observed emissions on this site. So that was a, a really interesting um, takeaway. So subsequent studies uh, have found a, a similar thing where, so this, this study went out and, and bagged a whole bunch of equipment and did these sort of aud full site audits of a single uh, unconventional natural gas well site. So they went out 17 times to the same pad and here I've kind of highlighted their finding, you know, although our data were from a single site, they too followed these similar patterns of skewed distributions. Um, in other words, the, the minimum and maximum results from the 17 different visits varied by a factor of 560. So it just, this, what, I guess what this data started to show to us and the, and the results coming out, it was like, you know, wow, continuous monitoring is actually extremely important for accurately characterizing emissions. Um, not, not only um, you know, do you need to have kind of wide area coverage and look at everything, but you kind of need to look at it all the time in order to have a true um, handle on, on what the emissions profiles are. Um, but the, the real value in continuous monitoring is not, not only in the sort of academic exercise of understanding, well, it's not only academic, it's important for a lot of other reasons, um, understanding the emissions profiles from these sectors, but it's in the mitigation. So like how fast can you fix leaks and how big an impact can you actually make by rapid find and fix? So um, what, what we're looking at here is data based on a real event that happened out in the field with one of our customers. And that was a, a stuck oil dump. And so um, we, we found the event kind of alerted on it right away. The operator got out there in two days and, and fixed the leak. And so um, it was about 100, 150 MCF a day emission, which actually, um, interestingly, the operator went and 
looked into their production data and it, it correlated exactly with a drop in production of about a third or a quarter of their production during that time when it was when it was happening so it's a pretty pretty serious you know even though this is a, a, a standard thing happening in the field these are like real numbers of of um you know kind of lost lost gas so what this graph is looking at is kind of the cumulative impact of a, a rapid find and fix so fixing the leak in two days versus kind of the two table elements from the the new quad o b and quad o c um, proposed rules so if, if that hadn't gotten caught until a monthly a bi-monthly survey or a continuous or rather a quarterly eldar survey um it would have been you know 10 or 20 times the the total cumulative cumulative losses so these kind of um you know examples really highlight the like really important benefit of continuous monitoring for a mitigation uh, from a mitigation standpoint so i'm going to kind of bump through a couple more case studies here and this one is also really interesting so we were out uh, monitoring again this is a customer site and um we this was a interesting one because this this well pad or uh, tank battery rather was um up like about four kilometers away from the central node so really long shot we were, it was almost like a a test test you know beam because it was so far out there so we started to show intermittent emissions between about 500 and a thousand mcf a day and the operator said okay well if that's real i'm going to hear it <laughs> when i go out there so they send a lease operator out there couldn't find anything i think they even maybe sent them out another time then they finally dispatched ogi sure enough what was happening was it was a vru malfunction coupled with high line pressure so that everything on the site was leaking but they were from kind of large diameter uh, apertures so that you couldn't you would never hear it so it was in uh, multiple release points with large diameter um release points that um were just releasing a phenomenal amount of gas and um and that it was not detectable by, by abo so um this is just another kind of interesting <laughs> you know you, you we always hear from customers like oh if it's 20 mc at the day like i'm gonna hear it when i'm out there and that's it's not always the case uh, it can be complicated sort of um combinations of problems causing the leaks uh just to put it in terms of dollar amounts so you know obviously the um if this would have gone until the next quarterly ogi uh, or quarterly flyover um or quite away semi-annual inspection I and mean, obviously these are these are enormous numbers of of lost product and way more than pays for continuous monitoring on all the sites on this node for many years and also pays for the repairs obviously that are needed so there's a lot of power in the in the quantified number and in the in the rapid find and fix so a last um case study that i'll go through here is another one that's kind of uh shows the the, the unique kind of power of continuous monitoring so here we had you know emissions are kind of bumping along around you know baseline values popped up triggered an alarm for the operator, they went out and fixed a failed site glass. Emissions popped up again, you know, because we initially saw kind of the, the return to normal, emissions popped up again, and uh, operator heads out again, fixed a PRV like a leak on a stock tank. One more time, emissions still hadn't gone up, down all the way. OGI follow-up then fixed four additional sources, and since then we've seen that site return to normal kind of baseline uh, emission rates. So um what what you're seeing here is that it's really important to be able to have you know continuous monitoring can find stuff fast it also can tell you um it can it can watch that facility afterwards and really verify the repair so if this had been um caught by an aircraft flyover for example that then had a you know a follow-up a week later um you know out here somewhere you wouldn't have um you wouldn't have been able to identify that this was probably a much more systematic issue for example a an overpressure event that would maybe have caused these multiple failure points. Um, so th this is another case where continuous kind of really is super helpful. Again, the, the, the dollar values on if that had gone for the next till the next monthly OGI or, uh, or actually this, I think I might have changed that to quarterly, but at any rate, the um, the lost product cost is is um, substantial and importantly, the lost gas to the atmosphere is is pretty serious. So um, we've talked about blind testing at MeTech and also a lot of like kind of real real world leaks, you know, out in the out in the wild. Um, and the other thing that's been really cool working with operators is the ability to fill in the gaps from the MeTech testing in order, you know, in other words, to kind of do really large emission rates. So with 
we've done um, blind tests in the field with a couple different operators at this point, and we've done everything from 10 MCF a day to like 300 MCF a day. So we've been able to kind of fill in that high end of the, the quantification spectrum. Um, and again, this is this um, this along with the flare emissions thing. I know I've heard from from folks kind of in the community lately that there is some concern that ground based monitors might not be able to quantify large emissions or or see large emissions, particularly flare emissions. And the, the, both of those things are something that we've blind tested with operators. So the flare emissions is another one. We not only have caught many, many malfunctioning flare uh, leaks for multiple different customers, but we've also done a blind test on flare emissions. So we didn't know where the operator was going to do this blind test and it, and it was a flare. So it's just we're getting some really nice proof points for being able to show that um, that those are um, those are able to be handled by the system. And I think that operator is going to put out a white paper. So hopefully that'll be able to be public soon. And then we've also done blind testing of localization um, on pad. So um, the last piece I'll go through before kind of jumping into our, our scaling and other markets is um, the idea of the work practice. So I, I think that uh, some folks are scared of <laughs> continuous monitoring because, and especially really high sensitivity continuous monitors, because they're like, I don't want to have to run out there for every single blip on the radar, you know? And I just wanted to make the point that um, even EPA recognizes that that's not how you would, would build a, a work practice. So um, there's been a lot of work in recent years by ourselves and the other folks doing continuous monitoring and um, to kind of figure out the best practice for work practices to to really make sure you're kind of like, you're not increasing truck rolls, you're just changing the timing of the truck rolls to happen when there's actually a problem. And by truck roll, I mean like an OGI survey. So in other words, that you were, we're trying to hone these work practices so that you're just shifting when you go out to a site to, to do a, a scan or an overview to when you know there's actually a problem that requires repair. Um, and that what's really interesting is that quantification itself, like having a quantified volumetric flow rate allows you to kind of figure out the work practice that's going to give you the maximum gains with the minimal follow-up. So finding that sweet spot. So here, what we're looking at is, um, is an Eldar Sim run by Highwood. I'm sure you guys know that, that crew. And um, the, the red line here is the, the total or the emissions through time. If there was no LDR or Eldar program at all, uh, the, um, the brown line is if it was a regulatory OGI program something like, I think this is quarterly OGI. And then, um, and this is for a, a, a reasonably high producing uh, or high emitting site um, from the Zavala Arisa paper 2015 is the distributions that go into producing these emission rates. Um, and then the, the various blue lines here are running the long path work practice with different thresholds of follow-up. So just because we see a 0.02 kilogram per hour leak rate, um, or 0.0, you know, whatever it is, 0.1 kilogram per hour leak, um, doesn't mean you would construct a work practice to go deal with that. Like you're gonna wait until it's something that's really meaningful. And so um, I would just caution, you know, urge caution when you're reading some of the white papers that are floating around, especially right now, um, that did not take care to put in the correct work practices. So if you look, you know, if you look at um, some of the modeling, if it doesn't have the right work practice put in there, it's going to make continuous look really expensive, but that's really not the case because we have um, certainly everybody working in this space has has really creative methods for making sure that the work practice fits the sensing modality so that operators are, are only really heading out there when they need to. Um, so in terms of what's, you know, kind of in the uh, in the backlog here for, for long path, um, I guess the only point to show this slide is just to to underscore the idea that like continuous monitoring is here, it's scalable, it's it's really happening. <laughs> you know, we're we're out there, and a bunch of other folks are out there as well. Um, this is kind of where we're at to date with installations and confirmed backlog through the end of next year. We're already operating in DJ Basin, Delaware, Midland, and Anadarko. And what's really cool about this uh, this modality is that it only it only would take a thousand long pass systems to cover the basically the entire Permian Basin, so that um, you know, the supply chain woes and stuff are not that bad because it's literally only a thousand sensors that you've got you've got to get out there. So um, it's a pretty scalable solution and that's that's exciting. Okay, so then into some of the when we're up at 30 minutes, so I'll try and go through this fast, but some into some of the cool 
interesting um, new ways that we're using this technology. So landfill emissions, obviously everybody's really getting interested in landfill emissions. It's probably going to be the next you know, big thing to be to be widely monitored. Um, the, the combs have a really cool footprint that matches this, you know, a small or mid-sized landfill, maybe it's like 370 acres, but Long Path can cover it at least that, and certainly of the larger facilities. And with the with the dual combs, you've you know the same ideas. You've got no calibration or maintenance and direct instrument comparability. If you wanted to use multiple combs for looking at hot spots, like the, the OTM 10 method, for example. And again, you know, kind of real-time readings and automated data delivery. So that's a really exciting space that we're um, just starting to get into. Um, a, a really cool one from a science perspective is um, Greg obviously still has a, um, an appointment at the university, and I also have a, a tiny little slice of my time is still over at University of Colorado. And it, part of that is um, is managing this NSF project that we have to look at um, permafrost methane fluxes. So right here, we're looking at the Goldstream Valley in Fairbanks, or outside of Fairbanks, Alaska. And we'll be setting up there in the coming months to do um, continuous monitoring of permafrost methane fluxes. Um, another really cool space um, for the combs is in agricultural emissions. So uh, uh, grazing, um, feedlots, crops, or, you know, burning, control burning. Um, and so I don't know if Greg wanted to jump in and talk a little bit about um, the, the combs in terms of these other species, but um, I'll let him jump in after yeah. I say that it's re the precise and calibration free nature allows you to like not only kind of close the inventories, but also like con confirm emission reduction strategies. So look at the before and after different approaches. So yep. Greg, did you want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is a little bit of work from our uh, partners, uh, um, Ian Connington, Brian Wash Washburn, Eduardo Santos from NIST and KSU, Kansas State University, um, that was recently published in Scientific Advances. And, and they were using frequency combs to measure multiple agriculturally relevant species around, you know, feedlot and those types of things. Um, uh, so I think that, I think that, um, uh, you know, it's very, it, you know, it, it's, it's important again to know that, that we can measure more than one gas. What's really been interesting is we've been working together with NIST, this same group, as well as Scott Didham's group, to push all the way out to, you know, between three and 10 microns. And out there, we can start to see, you know, NO and NO2, volatile organic compounds, N2O, lots of different um, really relevant species for these agricultural emissions. And so, First systems are like this was really the first first uh, deployment of that, um, but there's going to be more to come in these coming years as we start to mobilize these systems in the same way um, that we have the near infrared systems for methane. So very very exciting future for the technology in other ways. Yeah. Um, that was our our last slide. You know, I guess the key takeaways again are kind of this unique way of monitoring. We're we're happy to provide publications on. Uh, we've published a lot of the stuff and um, yeah, the kind of the emissions and cost benefits of continuous and uh, you know, all the, all the rest, but I'll leave that up as and people can kind of take a look while we answer questions.